We are in session number three of our series of messages on Just Married. And um, I don't know about you, but God has really continued to teach me quite a bit about this, this covenant of marriage. I'm 18 years in, and I feel like I'm still just getting started. And I have a lot to learn and a lot to go and to grow. And I pray that you feel the same way and that some of the elements that we've been looking at from a biblical perspective on marriage is ringing home with you and challenging you, encouraging you, maybe convicting you. We said in week one that it was important for us to lay out the purpose of marriage. And we saw in week one that, that marriage is both from God, it is a gift, and marriage is for God, it is a model. But if you think about it, it's actually a gift that we can give back to God. And, and so the purpose then of marriage is not just for my fulfillment, not just for me to get married because of what I stand to gain or for my wife to, to, to marry me for what she stands to gain, which wasn't a whole lot, but really for us to enter into this thing understanding there's a much bigger purpose than personal fulfillment and satisfaction through the institution of marriage. And the biblical teaching is that when it is done right and it's never done right all the time because we are imperfect people and we regularly mess up, but as we are growing in this, this relationship, we have the ability through our marriage to display to others and to the world the beautiful relationship of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And people can see and catch glimpses of that by the way that we live and breathe in our marriages. So the purpose is that it's both from God and it is for God. And then last week we looked at exactly what is marriage and saw that a lot of people enter into marriage with a contract mentality. Marriage, this relationship is based on if-thens. If you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. And as long as you do this for me, then I'll live up to my end of the contract. But if you start bombing on your responsibilities, well, then why should I give back to you if you're not giving to me? And we hit this vicious downward spiral, and everything explodes and implodes. We draw lines in the sand, and we're ready to break the contract because this just isn't working because it's not just bringing me personal happiness that I was so certain and so sure that that beautiful man or woman was going to do for me. And yet we saw that the biblical teaching is that at a much deeper, higher level, marriage is a covenant. A covenant entered into between a man and a woman and from God's covenantal relationship with mankind and with Christ's covenant with the church, the new covenant that he talked about, we, we, we drew some foundational elements of a covenant. It is based on unconditional promises. It is based on steadfast love or this loving kindness that God regularly shows to us that we should be showing to our spouse. God's desire for marriage is that it is permanent. And, and in, this, in this covenant, we live and breathe our marriage for the benefit of who? The other person. And if both parties will commit themselves to living in a covenant type of relationship and being quick to ask for and extend forgiveness when we fail because it will happen and it does happen regularly, we can embark on this incredible journey of a lifelong pursuit of developing a covenant relationship with our spouse and therefore modeling to the world again through that covenant, the covenant that Christ has made with his church. So I originally thought that today's message we were going to tackle, be able to tackle everything in one inclusive message of what God has led me to, but after thorough study and notes and writing stuff down, I realized that that would be a really, really lengthy message. And rather than put you through that, we are actually going to take two messages, uh, one message and make it two, this week and next week, because I believe when we, as we're building here, when we see the purpose of marriage, and we understand what marriage is and how it, it displays Christ in the church, well then the biblical teaching then is that within marriage, both the man and the woman have a role to play that will directly be corresponding to the roles of Christ and the church. And while I was hoping to tackle both the roles of men and women in one message, man, that is, you could do a whole series on that. So we're going we're gonna to spend today and we're going to look at the man's role, the husband's role in marriage. And then next week we're going to look at the woman's role in marriage. And I've got a special guest that's going to join me. And man, she is going to blow your socks off. Please don't miss next week. It's going to be a great, great week as well too. And I, I'm excited about this. Now ladies, you may want to get your nudge on here a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Nudge. This, this is the nudge right here. Not too hard. Don't let people behind you see, but just enough where he can feel it, you know, and you get in your points there. 
But, I mean, don't be like doing this. Don't do that. That's, that would be way too obvious. Unless you're on the back row, then only you and I would see it, okay? But if you're anywhere in front of the back row, just don't do that. Just a little gent. Obviously, I'm, I'm jesting here. Please, for the ladies in the house, don't, don't turn me off and say, well, this message isn't for me. You're just talking to the men today. No, 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 no. It is important that both men and women understand the biblical teaching of our roles together because there is a sense of accountability that we must bring to our marriage. Singles, single ladies, all oh, the single ladies, listen, do not for a moment think, well, I'm 10 years away from getting married, or I'm five years away from getting married, and your mom's saying, oh, no, no, you're 10 years away from getting married. Well, this isn't for me. No, 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 please don't, please don't go there. This is for you. This is for you because you are going to be given some clear teaching from God, I believe, on what you can be looking for in a man that you may enter into a covenant with. And again, it's, it's imperative that you understand and you really investigate. As I said last week, you know, if you're in the dating mode, as you're rating your dating while waiting for mating, you can actually investigate and, and check and hold that man up against the biblical teaching to see, can this guy really fulfill the covenant? Because it's very, very lofty. And then, of course, guys in the house, let me just, especially married guys in the house, just, I don't know, put, put both feet on the floor and don't lift them up. And if God steps on your toes, then consider it a great honor and a privilege because he's already stepped on mine in preparation for this message. I had some great conversations last night afterwards, a beautiful email from a gentleman that said, I I've heard messages upon messages and things, but last night, for some reason, God took this one and cut me to the core like, like none before. And he's really, really changed the way I'm approaching my marriage and my family. And it was just, I slept great last night. When you get an email like that right before you go to, those are the kind of emails you want to get as a pastor, especially right before you go to bed, because you just sleep with a great sense of knowing God was speaking to hearts, all right? So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew, Ephesians <laughs> chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This is Paul's teaching on marriage, and again, I, I know that what we're talking about here today in the non-Christian world, man, this is just, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. They say, oh, you're trying to drag us back into the dark ages, and this is not relevant for today, ah, oh, yada, yada, yada. But again, we understand that our desire here is to please God, and I think with a proper understanding, the roles that God has given us in marriage is very freeing, and it's, it's very protecting for our marriages. It is, it is biblical. Remember, as I said in week one, that the designer of marriage is given the right to be the definer of marriage. And God has defined, to some degree, the roles that he looks for men and women to fill within marriage. And so keep in mind here that in Paul's teaching here on marriage in Ephesians 5, it's really under two umbrellas. The first umbrella is at the beginning of chapter 5 where he says, be imitators of Christ. And so he's sharing with the man and the woman within the covenant of marriage, here's a way or ways that you can be an imitator of Christ. But under a slightly broader heading at chapter 4, for those of you that were here for the Ephesians series, you may remember that beginning in chapter 4, he talks about um, walking worthy of our calling to be a part of the church of God. And so these roles of a, of a husband and wife within marriage is both under the umbrella of imitating Christ, but also under the umbrella of a person who is called to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. I'll start off in verse 18 in Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul says this, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then he begins to play out for us a few things of what it may look like, not exhaustive here, but what it may look like to be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another. We just did this with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for who? Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. So this outpouring 
of individuals who are filled with the Spirit of God is that they're joyful, they don't hesitate to sing, they're making music in their heart, and so they make music with their mouth, doesn't say it's beautiful, it might be, it might be really bad to your ear, but it is still music, it is, it is flowing out of a Spirit-filled heart, and then flowing out of that is this mutual submission that people bring to the table within the Church of Christ, but then Paul then immediately flows this mutual submission into the marriage realm. Because he says, uh, verse 20, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, and in the original Greek, this is how it reads, wives to your husbands. He doesn't even use the word submit there again. It's just a natural flow out of the mutual submission that he writes about in verse 21. Wives to your husbands as to who? The Lord. For the husband is the head. I underline that word. We're going to talk about that today. Is the head of the wife. Is Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. And then we'll get to verses 25 to 27 in a moment. But it's interesting. Paul starts off talking about this mutual submission. I can say from experience, my wife and I brought to the marriage table, the marriage arena, a mutual submission in that, in that I should be willing to die for my wife. I should be willing to do and sacrifice comforts, sacrifice um, some wants and wishes that I have to honor and to uphold her, to live for her in our marriage. And if I'm going to live for her in our marriage, I have to bring that to the table in this covenant. But likewise, she does the same thing. She brings that same type of attitude to me. So there is this, if you will, mutual submission. Okay. However, please don't miss here Paul's teaching that this mutual submission with each other does not negate the defined roles that we have within our marriage. In fact, he talks about mutual submission in 21, and then he spends the next 12 verses talking about the very distinct differences that men and women play, husbands and wives play, within their marriage. And so mutual submission doesn't negate the God-ordained roles that both a husband and a wife need to fulfill. And, and I think it's important for everybody to know, too, that my mutual submission to my wife in our marriage uh, doesn't somehow wipe away the headship factor that God places on me in our, in our marriage arena. And, and, and let, let me give you an illustration. I think probably the best one we could use is when Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, right? He's the bridegroom, the church is the bride, he's the head of the church. When he was sitting with the disciples in the, in the upper room, just, just before he went to his crucifixion, he did an act that was, that was very humbling. He really humbled himself, and he got down and dirty, and he got on his knees and took a basin of water and a towel, and he went around to all the guys, and he washed their feet and did and performed the act of a servant. And so he was, he was serving them. But make no doubt, in that room, not one guy questioned who their leader still was. Even though he was serving them, they didn't question that Christ was still the leader and that here was the, the bride, the head, the bridegroom, the head of the church. They didn't understand it fully at that time, serving the church. But he was still the head. And so I think it's important that for the men and women to know that, that we serve. We bring a mutual submission, but that doesn't negate the roles that we fulfill in marriage. In fact, I found a great quote that, that goes like this. Servanthood does not nullify leadership. It defines it. Especially within, within the realm of marriages. Servanthood doesn't nullify leadership. It defines it. So, you know, we could stop right there and say, all right, we're done with the message. Hey, guys, let's see. H have you served your wife this week? Or have you demanded that she follow you and submit to your authority in your home? Woman, I'm the man. I mean, right there, that's, that's, that's challenging right there and convicting. Servanthood doesn't negate it. It, it defines leadership. So let me, let me, as the Bible says here, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So, guys, I think it's important to keep in mind here that the comparison is like Christ as is the head to the church. You're not Christ. And I'm certainly not Christ. And it's important. I'm not the Lord. This is not lordship that we're talking about here. I'm not the Lord of my home. Christ is the Lord of our home. He's the Lord and he's the Lord alone. You're not the Lord of your home. The Lord of your manor and all the serfs and peasants are here to serve you. That is so messed up. That's just not biblical. That's not teaching. But we are to fulfill this role and be like Christ in being the head of our home. So let me define headship, if I can, right here. This is not original with me. 
Again, some of the books I've been reading as a supplemental, obviously the scriptures are where we pull all of our teaching from, but supplemental reading, some of you have asked about this. There's three or four books that really help shape and define some of the practical ins and out things here. This Momentary Marriage by John Piper, The Marriage Mirror by Ed Young, Covenant Marriage by Gary Chapman uh, are three of the books that I am reading and, and going over that sort of help provide some supplemental thoughts. And this definition comes out of the book, This Momentary Marriage. So let me define headship for you and take a look. The divine calling of a husband to take primary, and I would just, that, that's a huge, it's not soul, but to take primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership, protection and provision in the home. The divine calling of a husband to take primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership, protection, and provision in the home. This is what I believe when we hold up the model of Christ being the head of the church, we have a lofty example to strive for in being the head of the home. It's a servant leadership. It is like Christ and it involves protecting and provision for our families. Now guys, for a moment, how you view this headship thing is, I believe, really um, powerful because if you view it in the wrong way, then I believe it will lead out to improper actions within the home. And let me explain what I mean. If we view this headship thing as a right, it's my right to be the head of my home. It's my right to lay down the law in my home. You see where this is going? This is my God-given right. You will serve me, family. If, if we view this as a right, then we will become very selfish. We will not be selfless. There will be very little of the servant leadership involved, and it will probably lead to abuse, control, neglect in the marriage, in the home, if we view headship as a right. It's not a right. We don't deserve it. Amen. Are you kidding me? But if we view it as a responsibility, if it's a responsibility to serve my wife, if it's a responsibility to protect my wife and children, if it's a responsibility to provide both spiritually and physically for my wife and my children, that's, that positions me to really serve them because I understand it's not a right and a privilege Leadership is often a burden. It's weighty. It's hard. It is a responsibility. And so I hope, I'm just trying to position us as I'm going to put some meat on the bones here a little bit because I think a lot of guys are just confused about what does it look like in my home? What does this headship, what does this leadership thing look like in my home? I'm trying to position us. If we understand it's headship, it's modeled after the headship of Christ. It's not a right. It's a responsibility for us to serve our wives and our children, to protect spiritually and physically, and to provide spiritually and physically for our families. Then I believe we're, we're positioned to properly and biblically fulfill the role that God has called us to do. The husband takes his cues in marriage from Christ in his relationship to his church. And headship involves primarily as its main meaning, leadership. The man leads out. Not soul. Not soul. Please understand, not soul responsibility, but primary responsibility. Headship involves leadership. Look at verses 25 to 27. As Paul explains how the husband leads much the way that Christ led his church. Husbands, love your wives. There's a leading in that. So i got to lead out in loving my wife. I actually have to do some things. We'll talk about that in a moment. Just as Christ loved the church, and how did he lead out in loving the church? He gave himself up for her. He led out in his love for the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So headship involves primarily as its main meaning that of leadership within the home and it's leading like Christ. And noticing in the definition, it is servant leadership. Servant leadership is a requirement for true headship in the home. All right, now, one, one or two thoughts to the men real quick, and then one or two thoughts to the ladies, to the guys. Because some of you right now may be thinking, I, I can't do this. 
I don't, I, don't, I don't even know any scriptures. I, I've, I haven't really read the Bible. I, I, I just, this whole leadership thing, I'm not a leader. I'm, I'm a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. This just, you don't understand the example that I had growing up in my home. Man, I love my dad, but man, he didn't give me an example. He didn't invest in me. I don't even know what, what leadership begins to look like. Oh, please understand. Thank you. Please understand. That was a woman, by the way, that did that, I think. Either a woman or a guy with a really high voice. One of those two. It may have been. Please understand here that this, this, this call of God, this responsibility that God's placed was, He would never call us to do something that He won't empower us to do. Amen. So for, for, if you're here today, listen close to me, man. If you're here and you're buying that lie from the father of lies, who is Satan, he's the father of lie, who is telling you, you can't lead in your home. Your wife is so much stronger than you are. She has so much more spiritual knowledge. She was raised in church. Man, you... you, you, you your thumbnail, that's about how much knowledge you have of the Bible compared to your wife. You can't lead out in your home. That's a lie from the father of lies because he doesn't want you to fulfill the role that God has called you to in your home. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if God has called you to fulfill the role of headship in your home, he will empower you to do it. I think you need to understand what it means because I think part of the lie is men have misunderstood what this headship thing really is, and so because we put this false falsification around it, then we shy away from it. And again, if you had a father, maybe you had a bad relationship with your dad, maybe you had a great relationship, but like I talked with somebody last night, man, their dad on the outside portrayed this thing of I'm leading my family and yada yada, but when they were behind closed doors, it was just the opposite. And man, this just trying to come to grips with that. Please understand that if your father didn't help prepare you for this, your heavenly father will. Amen. And if your earthly father did help prepare you for this, thank God that you had a dad that would do that for you. I'm one of those few that had a dad who wasn't perfect. Believe me, you've heard him preach here before. He wasn't perfect. All right? But he certainly, he, he followed hard after God to set an example and pour into me what this means. Now to the women, real quick here. You can't demand this from your husband. You can't. I mean, you can, but it won't work. Listen, your demanding headship or leadership from your husband is contradictory to the very thing that you want him to do. You want him to take the lead. But if you're demanding it from him, and you're saying, you have got to step up to the plate. I am tired of carrying the ball for this family. You have got to start leading this family. I'm not going to lead this family anymore. Huh. If he even gives in to you, he's not really leading. All he's doing is acquiescing to your demands. <laughs> he's not really leading. Be careful. You can't demand this from him. It must come from within. It must be brought about by the Spirit of God working miraculously in his heart and by the Word of God being applied to his life. So ladies, maybe some of you think, well, like, what do I do? I mean, you don't understand. I just want to turn to my husband right now and say, are you listening? Don't do that. First of all, don't do that. Pray diligently for him that God will work in his heart. And it's okay to have an open, honest conversation about where you are and what you desire. But to demand it from him, again, is contradictory to the very thing that we are or that you would be looking for. Pray that God would awaken this desire for headship and leadership in the home and then do everything that you can to encourage it and to empower him and again, women want to be loved much to the, to the same degree that men want to be respected. They really do. And that's one of the ways that you can encourage him. And I know Lillian does that for me quite regularly and quite frequently. Now, let's look at this leadership in provision and leadership in protection. All right? And, and sort of talk about that because there's two vanges. There's leadership in both spiritual and physical provision. And then leadership in spiritual and physical provision. Uh, protection. All right. So, gentlemen, first of all, leadership in spiritual provision. According to the scriptures, because of this designation, this responsibility that God has given to us for headship and leading out in our home, we are primarily, not solely, but we are primarily responsible for providing spiritually for our wives and our children. And that implies that if we are going to be able to provide for them, we must have something to provide. So there's no way that we can provide spiritually 
for our wife and children, if, if you should have children, if we ourselves are not going hard after God. And here's what I battle with a lot in my life, and guys, I think you can resonate with me. It's probably not that you don't desire it. If you're here and you're a Christ follower, you probably have this desire to really lead your home and to be a more godly man. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, some of this stuff may be like brand new to you, and you may be like, I don't even know where I stand with all this. Look, don't, don't, don't stop coming. Keep going. I believe the Spirit of God can enlighten and, and speak to your heart through this and, and, and call you across the line of faith. Please don't give up. But to the Christ followers in the house, listen closely. I think for us it's a matter of priority. Because some of us will go hard after our fantasy football league. And we are on top of the stats of what Drew Brees did last week. And I mean, we'll spend a few hours at night making sure that my team, if I've got to make a trade, I've got to make a flip-flop, we'll go hard after our favorite team. Uh, some of you uh, deer seasons get ready. We'll go hard after the monster buck. But we don't go very hard after God. And then we say, but I can't lead in my home spiritually. It's just not there. I just don't have the foundation. And I think for a lot of us, it's a matter of prioritizing in our life what's really important. And if we see ourselves as a God-given responsibility to lead out in our home in this spiritual provision, then there will be some actions that follow that acceptance of that responsibility to say, you know, there's some times I've got to put some other things aside so that I can go hard after God because my family needs me to spiritually provide for them. I've got to turn the game off so that I can invest spiritually. I, example, yesterday. Saturdays are unique for us with a Saturday night service, so we have our mornings and maybe an hour or so, whatever, to watch a game, and then as it starts plugging into the afternoon, you've got to put those things aside, start getting ready for Saturday night service and making sure everything is good to go. So yesterday, I was sitting down, and I was watching the Florida State criminal, Seminoles, F Florida State Seminoles <laughs> play in Boston College. I used to live in Florida, so that was a long-standing joke. Some of you get that. Some of you have no clue what that means. And I heard my daughter and youngest son go upstairs and talk to their mom. Last week in children's church, thank God, Amy, we have a children's ministry that is very proactive and is challenging our children. And they send assignments home. And one of them last week was read through Hebrews 11 with your children and then have them pick, to, pick a character from Hebrews 11, explain what kind of faith they had, and then find out a little bit more about them. Well, the jury, we hadn't done that yet, but remember, it was only Saturday. It was still Sunday, so we had another day to go. So I heard Kaylee and Luke go upstairs. Now, watch, I'm watching the game. This is my chill time, right? I need this chill time in my life because I'm getting, it's going to be a busy weekend. So I'm watching the game, and I hear them upstairs say to Mom, Mom, can you read through Hebrews chapter 11 with us and, you know, do the deal, yada, yada, yada? I'm like, yeah, you go, kids. Mom needs to help out with that. <laughs> Here's what she says. Go ask your dad. <laughs> now, I wish that I could say to you that, that my initial response was, you know what, that's right. I need to take the lead, and I need to invest in my children spiritually, right? Turn the criminals off. Come on, kids. Let's do this. That's not what I did. In my mind, I, again, I'm just trying to show you... I, you you got an imperfect guy helping to lead and speak up here because my initial thought was, no, Lily, don't say that. <laughs> this, this is my time. They're going to come running down here, and then what am I supposed to do? What, do I look at these precious little kids and say, no, I don't want to teach you the Bible. I want to watch football. <laughs> Girl, you're putting me, what are you doing? That was my initial thought. Now, this is all like two or three seconds. You know how it just through your mind. I'm like, ah. Oh. So I hear the pitter-patter of the feet coming down the stairs. But honestly, again, God just is amazing. The Spirit of God said, oh, what are you speaking on this weekend? <laughs> oh, yes, you're right. And, you know, and then quickly, luckily, while the initial response was not good, the second response was, God, you're right. What, what, is this, what does this game matter? I got kids that want to read the Bible. Are you kidding me? Off with you. Come here, kids. And Luke and Kaylee sat right down next to me. We cracked open, and I read all of Hebrews 11, and they sat there and listened. And then for Luke, he wanted to do Noah, so then we went and read Genesis chapter 6 and part of chapter 7, and he was just soaking up like a sponge. Kaylee got her pen out. She was writing about Abraham and Sarah. And, and now, now here's, here's my point. I could have missed an incredible opportunity to lead out in spiritual provision for my children because of a stupid football game. 
And I wonder how many of us, day after day, neglect the spiritual provision of our home and our children and our wives and our families for something that is sports related that won't mean a hill of beans for all of eternity. And please, I'm not saying football is wrong. I love it. Don't you get that? I mean, I struggled with it. I, I, but it's prioritizing. And then we sit back and say, I can't lead out. We can. We must. God will hold me accountable for my family at the end. I will stand before him and I'll give an account for the Drury clan. And what did I do to invest in my children? Men, some of you guys, I lovingly say this, you need to get off your blessed assurance and start caring more about investing in time with your children than with your fantasy football league. Seriously. Spend some time in investing spiritually with your wife than about your favorite player. How can we miss the boat? And then we wonder why families are crumbling. And we wonder why men can't lead. Heck, they're leading in every other arena except the most important one of all, their families. Man, I love you guys enough to speak the truth into your hearts and speak the truth into your lives. And I pray that that seed falls on fertile ground, not hard, rocky soil that you curl up and say, don't you talk to me like that. I'll do my home however I want. Yes, and then someday when you're, when you're, when you're trying to bail your kids out of jail somewhere or you're trying to, to overcome this huge mistake that they've made, you're going to look back and say, I wish I would have turned the TV off and read the Bible to my kids. Mm. I'm just passionate. I love you enough to passionately speak the truth into your lives. Now, here's a key factor that I think, I think this week struck with me that I've never really realized before. I think so many guys are afraid of this. Ladies, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but last night at least, in, that, in the crowd, the ladies were doing this. So, you know, if I'm wrong, don't correct me now. Wait till after the service, all right? Because I got to get through this, but come talk to me afterwards. Guys, what our wives long for is spiritual and moral initiative from the men. Not that you have to be spiritually more competent than your wife. Not that you have to be biblically farther along than where she is, but that spiritually and morally you will rise to the occasion and take the initiative in leading out in your home. Spiritual and moral initiative, not spiritual and moral domination. That's not headship at all. Quote, there is no necessary connection between being an effective leader in your home and being more intellectual, we know that's not true, or more competent than your wife. Leadership does not assume it is superior. It assumes it should take initiative. Guys, I think some of your wives are just waiting for you to take some initiative in your home and have a deep conversation with your wife to talk to her about spiritual things. I wonder how many men that sat in the room last week actually went back and took the initiative in their home and said, all right, Pastor Mike gave us some great questions that we need to ask, and I want to start this whole thing off because I love you enough. I need to ask you three or four questions right now. That's simple. That's taking initiative. But many men, we sit back and say, I, I, I just, I can't lead. I, I got to be a spiritual theologian. No, you don't. Just take some initiative. Take some initiative. Leadership in spiritual provision. Leadership in physical provision. And again, this is not the sole provider thing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying we need to have a heart that desires to physically provide for our family. Um, well beyond just providing shelter or providing finances or whatever. I'm talking about even physically providing for the needs of our wife. Guys, let me ask you a question straight up. Do you know what some of the most most powerful needs that your wife has right now are? And some of you may be like, uh, uh, I don't know. I, just, yeah, <laughs> I guess not. Then that tells me right there that you're not meeting her need for communication. <laughs> I, I, that tells me right there. There is a physical need that our wives have. Guys, I want, I want to give you a little secret right here. This is a gem, a nugget. It's one of the best questions you could ever ask your wife. I hope you, you download this sucker, okay? So how does that make you feel? <laughs> and, and I'm going to give you how to ask it. 
you lean in, look in her eyes, not like this. So how does that make you feel, Owen? <laughs> Don't do that. Turn it off. She shares something, you say, so how does it make you feel? And then, oh, get ready, because she will tell you. I'm telling you, she will tell you. And you know, it's like opening a window to her soul, isn't it? Ladies, I bet some of you are just dying for your husband to go there with you. I, 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 my experience in counseling and talking with couples, there's some of you that are just dying for your husband to put everything aside, to send all the kids to go play somewhere or do something and just not out in the street, and then sit down with her and say, all right, let's talk. And she begins to talk, and you say, well, how does that make you feel? I genuinely want to know how you feel. It's, it's These are physical needs that our wives have that we have to lead out, and this is being a leader in our home. It's taking a little bit of initiative. It's a little, some of you, some of you guys, she like has to come stand in front of the TV and do this. I mean, she could take her clothes off and stand in front of the game and do this, and you're like, hey, can you move, please? I'm just, we'll get to that in a minute. They're almost ready to score. They're in the red zone. I, let's lead out on these things. I mean, a guy was like reading an article to his wife. They were sitting at the breakfast table, and he's like, this is unbelievable. This article says that women need to use 30,000 words a day, while men only need to use 15,000 words a day. And she says, well, duh, it's because we have to tell you guys everything twice. <laughs> and so he looks at her and says, what? <laughs> Point in case. Physical needs. How about leadership and spiritual protection? Guys, I hope you see yourself as a sentinel, as a guard. Now, you may not have, well, you may have a machine, you may not have a machine gun. You may have a stash somewhere. <laughs> But I mean, when you see yourself guarding your family, how do you guard your family? I guard my family with prayer. I guard my family with the word of God. I, I guard my family by watching and observing. I guard my family with great wisdom and discernment. And it takes courage to spiritually protect our families. It takes courage to step out and to spiritually protect our family. Guys, do you pray for your wife and your children regularly? That's taking the initiative and leading out. That is not a hard thing. I promise you it's really not to bow down and give five minutes of your time and say, God, protect my children today at school because they may be bullied, they may be tempted, they may be made fun of, um, they may struggle on the test. I ask your physical and spiritual protection for my children today. God, pray for my wife as you know, she goes here or as she does this or as she has this conversation. Just help. I mean, what is hard about that? It's leading out, taking the initiative. Here's one for you. If you're taking notes mentally or, or you're writing them out, guys, what's wrong with setting standards for a wife and children? Here's a question. Does your home have any standards? Or is it like a free-for-all and everything goes? Or do you have standards? Now, I'm not saying that you walk in one day and say, all right, I have some edicts for my home. I have set standards, and here's what we're all going to do. I would encourage you. Remember, you don't bear sole responsibility. You work with your wife on these things. But setting standards in your home about what will be allowed on television and what the kids can and cannot watch, and then enforcing the standards. It is, it is imperative that we lead out in spiritually protecting our children. It's imperative that we lead out in spiritually protecting our marriages. And you heard me talk about hedges before, that we take the initiative and put up hedges in our families and in our wives, and we work through these things. What's going to be allowed on TV? What movies will you go to and that you'll allow the kids to go to? What music uh, w will you allow them to listen to? Dads, how are you going to let your daughters dress? Is that an issue to you or not? It should be. We have a vital role to play to our children to show them how they dress sends a message to the guys that they're hanging around with. And while my wife is the primary player in this, make no mistake, she works diligently with Kaylee about modesty and what that looks like and, you know, what it doesn't look like. I know that as a dad, from a man's perspective, I have a great opportunity to lead out in spiritually guarding my daughter and helping her understand the truth behind modesty and then praising her when she looks good, but praising her more importantly for the inside of who she is and who God's made her. These are, I'm trying to give you meat on the bones do you feel me today in the house? Just, okay, I just want to make sure that, I, that we're ringing true here. This is just examples of meat on the bones kind of things here. Uh, one final thing under spiritual protect, protection. In Ephesians 4, verse 26, the Bible says, In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I think this is huge. Guys, in leadership, in spiritually protecting our families, 
I believe that we must take the lead in reconciliation in the home. And yet, I think so many guys, when an issue happens, whether it was her fault or his fault, they just like dive in and sit there, you know, you know no, she's wrong. She's going to come back to me. I am not giving in. I'm the man of my home. What? Who do we lead like? Christ. Christ didn't say, oh, the church is sinful. Until you clean your act up, I am not going to come die for you, you, you pathetic people. Until you actually show that you love me, I'm not going to initiate any reconciliation. He said, you're hopeless. I am going to come to you and I'm going to reconcile to you. And as the men, we lead out in our homes. We lead out in seeking reconciliation with our wives and even with our children. Two weeks ago, I, you know, I went off on Zach in the morning. He was a pill that morning. And, you know, I, I, I guess I was a pill <laughs> that morning. And the two pills together didn't, didn't match. And I just, you know, I just let my anger get the best of me. And all day, God convicted me. He just, he just bashed me in a good way and wouldn't let it go down. And so as soon as we, as soon as we picked the kids up, I just pulled Zach aside and I said, I have got to apologize to you. I was an idiot this morning. The way I treated you, the way I talked to you, I'm sure that didn't set your school off right. Please forgive me. And in true kids fashion, you know what he says? Oh, Dad, don't worry about it. Yeah, that's fine. Gives me a hug and a kiss and we're good. You know, why, why can't we do that as adults? Oh, no. Come on. You did it. Now, you step over that line first. Men, remember, it's the leadership. Taking the leads. I don't care whose fault it is. I want peace in our home, and I don't want the devil to get in here and to mess up our marriage. I'm coming to you, and I'm, I'm apologizing for my part. I'm apologizing for my part. And then headship means go ahead. Go ahead and lead out. And then finally, leadership and physical protection. I, I think this is a no-brainer here. <laughs> if you're in bed at night and you hear a sound and you think it's somebody, you don't roll over and say, oh, I think somebody's in the house. <laughs> I checked last time. <laughs> this, is, this is an equal marriage. It's your turn. I got a Bowie knife in my bottom door or the 22s over in the... Go for it. We ought to get out of bed and we ought to go check it out. Even if she's a black belt in karate. I mean, you, you, know, you wound him first and let her finish him off and take him out. I don't, <laughs> provide spiritual or provide that physical protection. I mean, I ought to want to protect our families. All right, let me close with this example. Just to show you, I, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This isn't just like... Hey, yeah, okay, I sort of get this. I want to show you the clearest example from Scripture of how God holds a man responsible for his home. Okay? Um, primary, not soul. Primary. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are in the perfect place, perfect people, perfect relationship with a perfect God. The evil one comes in, causes them to sin, and who bit the, or the, the apple? Who bit the fruit first? Who was it? It was Eve, all right? She, she gave him, but then so did Adam too. But Eve, Eve was the first one, okay? So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. So God comes, like he would do on a regular basis, in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the who? Man. He singled out the man and said, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Why did God do that? Because it's in keeping with God's plan for the design of marriage that from this headship standpoint, the man is held as the primary responsibility for leading out in his home by serving, protecting, and providing. And that's why I said, one day I will stand before God and I'll give an account for the jury clan. And how I led, how I served, how I protected, how I provided. God, help us, guys, that we will embrace that role and we will not be fearful of it any longer and say, all right, I'm not anywhere near I need to be, but I can take initiative. My wife needs me to take initiative. My children need me to take initiative. And God will empower me to be what he desires me to be in my marriage.